right, top 10 ocean liners, let's do it. So this one's gonna be a little bit different. Normally on this channel, everything is very tightly scripted and planned out and read with the monotone voice that you all know and love. But this one, we're gonna be mixing it up a bit. We're gonna chat about our favorite ocean liners. So get ready to be offended and type out your death comments. But before you hit send, just remember that these are my opinions, they're completely subjective, and they're based on the following criteria. One, I'm looking at the overall career and impact of the ship. Two, I'm looking at the design and really how pretty she is. And three, it's really just what I want to sail on this ship. And I'm just going to warn you now, I'm going to be leaving off one major ocean liner that's probably going to cause most of you to unsubscribe, so get ready for that later. But enough warnings. Here are my top 10 ocean liners. Number 10, Italy's Michelangelo. If you've been listening closely, you know that I have a soft spot for weird ass funnels. And boy does Michelangelo have some weird ass funnels, and I absolutely love them. Along with the Raffaello, the Michelangelo was one of the last purpose-built ocean liners. Her maiden voyage was in 1965, and she was out of service by 1975. Her career was relatively short, coming at a time when ocean liner travel was already massively on the decline. Really, the main reason she's on this list is because, from the inside to the outside, she was an absolutely beautiful ship. Her white hull, her interiors, and her weird-ass funnels left an impression, and I'm sure she was a wonderful ship to sail on. And I'm not gonna lie, part of the reason she's on this list is because in 1966 she was hit by a rogue wave so intense that it collapsed her forward superstructure. It's a crazy incident, but it also inspired many ships with aluminum superstructures to add strengthening in their forward sections, which I think is pretty cool. But really, we're just getting started because number nine is the New Amsterdam, a ship that to me exemplifies the perfect ocean liner. I mean, look at her, she's beautiful. And if you're noticing a trend, you're right, because this list is mainly about the ships that I find the most beautiful. To me, ocean liner design really hit its stride in the 1930s. It's when ship designers started moving away from boxy designs to streamlined, beautiful sweeping lines. And I think the New Amsterdam is a great example of a ship that pulls this off perfectly. Built for the Holland America Line in 1936, the New Amsterdam had a long and successful career. She was immensely popular, and in a time when ocean liners represented their nations, she was a source of great Dutch national pride. Her interiors were beautiful. She also had the largest air conditioning plant and the highest percentage of private bathrooms of any ships afloat at the time. She was also a major asset to the Allied war effort, even though, ironically, she was dubbed the Ship of Peace when she was originally built. Because unlike so many other ocean liners, she was not designed with war service in mind. My only minor qualm with her is I think her funnels are slightly too small, and slightly out of balance for the rest of the ship. But other than that, she's beautiful. Hey, no one's perfect. But speaking of perfect, coming in at number 8, the SS United States. Okay, calm down. I can feel you typing away your death threats. How dare I, a humble YouTuber, rank the big U so low on my list. But hear me out. I think technically, the SS United States was probably the most impressive ocean liner ever constructed. Her speed record was incredible, and will almost certainly never be matched by another vessel of a similar size. Unless there's somehow some weird revival of transatlantic ocean travel, but I really don't think that's going to happen. But who knows? I tell history, not the future. But unfortunately, speed isn't everything, and as I said at the outset, one of my biggest criteria is the decor and onboard experience on these ships. Basically, would I want to sail on this ship if it existed today? With the SS United States? Uh, yeah, kinda. But not really. I find her interiors a little bit stale and dated. Her design was very of the moment, and to me, that particular moment just doesn't hold up very well, especially when compared to other design periods. I also personally just don't think the United States lines ever match the glamour and mystique of the European lines. And if I was picking a liner to sail on at that moment, I would probably pick the Queen Elizabeth or, later on, the SS France. The SS United States was essentially a Navy troop ship that was decorated for passenger service, and she just doesn't do it for me. That said, I really want to visit her in Philadelphia, and I deeply support the United States Conservancy's efforts to restore the ship. She deserves a future, and I'm including a link to the Conservancy where you can donate to help save her. But speaking of the SS France, coming in at number 7, the SS France. And I mean, just look at her. Look at those weird ass funnels. She's gorgeous. And to be clear, this is the SS France. While I appreciate the SS Norway's career and her impact, the conversion ruined her design. And that 1990 refit was a crime that deserves jail time. The SS France was a late attempt to recapture some of the glory of the SS Normandy, 
And while I don't think they fully match the iconic status of the Normandy, I love the streamlined look of the SS France. She was a beautiful ship that tastefully modernized the iconic look of the Normandy without just straight up copying her. While ships from the 1950s and 60s can be a bit spotty with their interior design, I like SS France's a lot, and I think the mid-century modern aesthetic works really well for her. All in all, she was a beautiful ship, and her conversion to the Norway, though an aesthetic tragedy, was a major step in shaping the modern cruise industry, and that certainly deserves some acknowledgement. Number 6. The RMS Lusitania Now, I struggled a bit on this one on whether or not it should be the Lusitania or the Mauritania, and you'll see later on why the logic of this list is pretty flawed. But when it comes to the Lusitania and the Mauritania, I have to give it to Lusitania because her interior spaces are simply stunning. The Lusitania and the Mauritania were the first real superliners, and though that name could mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, I think Lusitania and Mauritania really exemplify what people mean by superliner. Launched in June of 1906, the Lusitania absolutely changed the game when it came to ocean liner design. They were by far the fastest and significantly larger than anything that came before them. The Lusitania sinking is often overshadowed by the Titanic disaster nowadays, but it was a significant world event and it helped pull the United States into World War I, which was a pretty big deal. Number 5. Good ol' SS Bremen. If you've watched my video on the Bremen, you know that I have a soft spot for this German liner. She was beautiful, and more importantly, she really reignited the competition to build the greatest ocean liner that had stalled after World War I. Bremen was way ahead of her time. She was one of the first major ships to sport a bulbous bow, and she crushed the Mauritania speed record, which had been held for almost a decade. She was a beautiful ship inside and out and her story was a pretty fascinating one. She also had a surprising impact on world history that I feel doesn't get much attention. After protesters repeatedly ripped down the Nazi flag from the decks of the Bremen in New York Harbor, Hitler was so outraged by the protests, he made the swastika the national flag of Germany. And her escape from New York Harbor at the outset of World War II is a pretty impressive story. But I do have to dock major points for her being a Nazi liner, because, I mean, you know, they're Nazis. But I still think she was a beautiful ship. Number 4. The RMS Aquitania Now, I may be a bit biased toward the Aquitania, and it might have earned her a ranking or two higher on this list. She was the ship that carried my great-grandfather back to the United States after World War I. He was deeply impressed by the ship and bought a postcard on board. That postcard sits in my collection today and helped inspire some of my passion for ocean liners. Aquitania was known as the Ship Beautiful, and it's easy to see how she got that title. Her interiors were beautiful, bright, and spacious. She was deeply loved throughout her long career and was one of the few vessels to serve both World War I and World War II. She was also the last four stacker in service and one of the finest representations of that era of superliner. While I love Aquitania's interiors, I'm less of a fan of her exterior appearance. I think head on she's a beautiful ship, but her aft section loses me. I believe ships should look just as nice sailing away as they do sailing towards you. And to me, Aquitania's boxy aft superstructure just feels a little bit sloppy and lacks the grace seen on other ships. But all in all, she well earned her title as a beautiful liner. Number 3. The RMS Queen Elizabeth I have to say, now that we're in the top 3, all 3 of these ships are pretty much my favorite. And really, depending on my mood, any number of them could be my first, second, or third choice. And I absolutely love the Queen Elizabeth. Now I hear what you're thinking. Wait a minute, Queen Elizabeth? Not the Queen Mary? What the hell? I'm gonna write a mean comment about his voice. But hear me out. I didn't wanna include both the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth on this list. And to me, between the two, Queen Elizabeth always will win. Plus, I wanna give you something to comment on and get mad about, because I love. Okay, let me explain. The Queen Mary's design played it safe. Her builders clearly had little desire to rock the boat and they essentially designed a larger, faster Aquitania. If you look at ships launched around the same time, like Bremen, Rex, Normandy, New Amsterdam, the Queen Mary is almost startlingly dated in comparison. Now don't get me wrong, I do love the Queen Mary, and her impact on culture and ocean liners in general is undeniable. She's probably one of the most famous ships afloat. But to me, the Queen Elizabeth is the better ship, with the Queen Elizabeth, Cunard White Star took the opportunity to modernize Mary's design. They clearly took cues from the Normandy, and I think that yielded a more attractive liner. Her improved funnel design, the removal of the well deck, and hiding her deck machinery made her look far more streamlined and modern. She was a wonderful marriage of the tradition of Queen Mary and the modernity of the Normandy. 
Her interiors were somewhat similar to the Queen Mary, but she was far more efficient, able to achieve similar speeds with half the boilers. I think if Cunard had allowed Elizabeth to compete with Mary's speed, she would have been capable of beating Mary's record. But of course, we'll never know for sure. And finally, something that often feels overlooked to me is Queen Elizabeth's size. At 83,673 tons, she was the largest ship in the world for decades. A larger ship wouldn't be built until the Carnival Destiny in 1996. That means she spent half of the 20th century being the largest passenger ship ever built. To me, that's damn impressive and earns her a high spot on any list. Number 2. The RMS Olympic. That's right. So here's the thing. Like a lot of ocean liner enthusiasts, the Titanic story is what got me interested in the topic in the first place. I was fascinated by the disaster, and to this day, I love poring over every detail of the night she sank in the ship herself. But it's not just her sinking that endures me to the Titanic. I absolutely love her design. Her interior spaces, her spacious decks, her stunning grand staircase, I love all of it. My favorite aspect of her design is the symmetry of it all. Her aft superstructure gracefully recedes to her aft well deck and poop deck, which mirror the proportions of her bow. She looks fantastic sailing toward you and sailing away from you. In short, the Titanic is great, even if she didn't sink. But here's the thing, nearly every image of the Titanic is actually a picture of the Olympic. The ship that I fell in love with is really the Olympic. While I think the improvements made to the Titanic made her a slightly better ship, she was essentially a carbon copy of the Olympic, and until April 14, 1912, the Olympic was by far the more famous ship. Unfortunately, the Titanic disaster greatly overshadows the long and impressive career the Olympic enjoyed. She also crashed into all kinds of things and managed not to sink. Ironically, I think you could argue that the Olympic actually was unsinkable. She was a total badass and actually ran down a U-boat during the war. She was a popular option for crossing the Atlantic for the better part of two decades, and she was the only Olympic-class liner to achieve what her builders actually envisioned. Imagine what could have been if all three liners saw the careers they were supposed to. Titanic was the ship I fell in love with, but at the end of the day, she was a copy of the Olympic, and so for this list, I think I'm gonna have to go with the Olympic. Number one, and this is gonna be no surprise to anyone who pays attention to this channel, that's right, the SS Normandy. When she launched in October 1932, the Normandy was by far the largest ship in the world, and when she entered service in 1935, she easily captured the speed record. She ushered in a standard of size and speed that only a few ships would ever rival in the ocean liner era. To be fair, I do think in practice she would probably be less comfortable to spend a lot of time on. That main dining room is impressive, but I could see the scale of the space becoming almost oppressive after a long meal and a healthy serving of the French line's famous free table wine. I think anyone who scoffs at Normandy for failing to turn a profit is ignoring the fact that her career was cut short by World War II. While the Queen Mary was clearly more successful financially and far better suited to the difficult economic circumstances of the Great Depression, Normandy only saw four seasons of service. That's not enough time for any company to recoup a ship's building costs. And while Normandy's costs were subsidized by the French government, that was actually the case for nearly all the ships on this list, including the Queen Mary and the SS United States. And frankly, the conversation over her profitability misses the point. The Normandy was a slightly ridiculous, over-the-top ship, but just take one look at her. She's objectively absolutely beautiful, inside and out. She was a stunning triumph of naval architecture that continues to inspire shipbuilders to this day. Just take one look at the Queen Mary II. Her design clearly takes a lot of inspiration from the Normandy, maybe a little bit more than her Cunard namesake. Normandy was the pinnacle of everything that makes ocean liners great. Her glamour, her design, her speed, the ship was an absolute work of art. She will never be challenged. No one will ever build another ship like Normandy. And to me, that's what makes her the greatest liner to ever sail the Atlantic. All right, that's my list. I hope I didn't viscerally offend any of you. But listen, if I did, that's part of the fun of being an enthusiast. We all get to learn about these liners and form our own opinions. So I would love to hear what your favorite liner is. Let me know in the comments below. List out all 10. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that you'll hit that like button and maybe subscribe. And be on the lookout, I've got another more normal ocean liner history video coming out in the next couple weeks. Until next time. I need a better sign off.